I, um, I have a challenging message for you today. Some of you are saying, why change the habit of a lifetime? I know. But I hope it will be an encouraging message, an uplifting message, and a freedom message to you today. My, my title is Doors of Opportunity. You, know, you may not see that word opportunity very clearly. And there's a reason for that, because sometimes the doors that get put in front of us don't look like opportunity. They look like problems, they look like difficulties, they look like whatever, but they don't look like doors of opportunity that God can use to bless you. But sometimes they are. And I just want to talk a little bit today about some of those doors of opportunity. I'm going to start off with a scripture. Uh, I've not put the reference up there, but it's Matthew chapter 5, and it's starting at verse 43. If you want to follow it in your Bibles, if you've got it on your phones or wherever, Matthew 5, verse 43 to 48. And uh, Jesus is speaking. It's the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' great teaching to his disciples about the kingdom. And he says this, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Don't even the tax collectors do that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, before you take a sharp intake of breath at that last sentence, let me just explain what that word perfect is. A translation from a Greek word that does not mean faultless, sinless, spotless, never done anything wrong. Otherwise, we're all out, aren't we? No, no chance of us being perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect if perfect means exactly the same as he is. But no, that word perfect means grown up. It means mature. It means getting out of childish ways. It means mature thinking, grown up thinking. It means becoming complete in what God has for us. That's what Jesus is challenging us to do. When uh, we were at the men's conference a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Paul Lloyd from, from Victory Outreach spoke, and it was an amazing message, and he said something that, that really stuck with me. He said this, he said, The greatest mistake that you can make as a Christian is to think that you have been saved so that you can live a normal life. The greatest mistake that you can make as a Christian is to think that you've been saved so that you can live a normal life. You were not saved so that you could just carry on as normal, come to church on a Sunday, sing a few songs, listen to a little speech every week, go home again. No, you were saved so that you could be transformed. You were saved so that you could live a higher life, a blessed life. It is quiet in here today. I expected a few more amens from that. Anybody agree with me or anybody want to come for ministry afterwards? You're either going to have to give me a little bit of support here, otherwise there's going to be a long ministry line at the end of this. We were not saved so that we could deal with our problems the rest of our life. Rachel was talking before about people trapped in anxiety, hopelessness. I know that happens, depression, all sorts of things. But, you know, the promise of Jesus is so clear. He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. He came to set us free. He came to, to break prison doors open. He came to break chains. He came that we might have freedom from every one of those things that is holding us back and holding us down. That is the promise of Jesus. And I'm going to stick to his word. Above any circumstance, above whatever we, 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 we may be experiencing ourselves, we are meant to get free from our problems so that we can help other people with their problems. 
so that we can pray for other people's problems, so that we can carry the burdens of others and not walk around with our own burden the whole time. Life was not meant to be for that. We, we're called to be free so that we can concentrate on the kingdom of God. And there was a great illustration in the Old Testament uh, of the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness. They came out of Egypt. They got delivered from the hand of Pharaoh. And they came into the wilderness and they got stuck in the wilderness for 40 years. And what happened to them in the wilderness? You look at them. They were constantly dealing with their own problems for 40 years or call it a lifetime. Dealing with their own frustrations, their own complaining, their issues, their attitudes. Forty years of that, it was all about them. But you look at the generation that went into the promised land, the Joshua generation. Somehow they got themselves free of all that. Somehow you never hear about them complaining. You never hear about them having issues. They just got on with kingdom work, conquering cities, seeing God do things, strongholds coming down, all sorts of amazing things happen to them. What a contrast. And it is astonishing to me that the Israelites could get saved from Egypt and then spend the next 40 years, or as I say, let's call it the rest of their lives, dealing with their own problems. Saved from Pharaoh, so through the Red Sea by a miracle, free from slavery, free from Egypt, new life, new possibilities, a God who's guiding them. Tremendous testimony. Moses said, those Egyptians that you see today, you will see them no more. And yet, stuck in their problems, circling round mountains. And by mountains, I mean issues for the next 40 years. That was so not their purpose. Now, I know Pastor Paul was preaching last week, and he mentioned something about this, and he said how that the, the, the wilderness was a preparation for the children of Israel being in the promised land. And I know where he was coming from. I know what he was saying. And yes, God used the time that they were in the wilderness to teach them lessons that they needed to learn. But he never intended them to be there. I can't say that he ever intended them to be 40 years in a dry desert land. Because God's promise is not dry, dead, desert land. God's promise is fruitfulness and abundance. God did not say, I'm going to lead you into a land full of rocks and sand and desert where there's no water and it's going to be trials for the rest of your life. He said, I'm going to lead you into a land flowing with milk and honey where there are olive fields and vine vineyards and you're going, to, you're going to take that land. That was God's promise. And you know how in, in the beginning of Deuteronomy, he doesn't say it was 40 years to the promised land. He said it was 11 days journey. 11 days journey from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Bani at the beginning of the land. God did not intend 40 years. He intended 11 days. In other words, no time at all. You can get straight into abundance. You can get straight into promise. You can get straight into victory. Getting three amens. It's going well. <laughs> and the, the 40 years in the wilderness was simply the consequence of the people's unbelief and their issues but that all very well for them but it is a picture for us the apostle paul says these things happen to them as examples so that we should not fall into the same traps that they did and it is a picture for us of the possibility that you can get saved and have an amazing testimony and get a glorious salvation and then spend the rest of your lifetime dealing with your own issues and your problems and circling around those non-stop no progress never getting to what God intended you to do as a free person I know people with amazing testimonies and if they came up here and told you the story of how they got saved and where they've come from and what God brought them into and, and all of that, you'd be, wow! And yet, they're stuck. They're stuck because of an issue. They're stuck because of what something somebody did or something somebody said and they can't get out of it and they won't forget it and they can't forget it. They are stuck and they are in a wilderness. They are in a dry and desert land instead of a land of promise. Because that, that there is a difference between being saved and being free. And I want you to be free today. And Jesus wants you to be free today. And God wants you to be free. You could, be in you could have been in chains for 40 years. God wants you to be free today. You could have been in a prison 
And it could have been in your, of your own making. And you could have been in that prison 40 years. You could love Jesus. Again, like Rachel was saying, the, the people who love Jesus, people who know Jesus, people who know the word, but they're just stuck in something and they can't get out of it. I want to tell you, it's not God's promise for you. God's promise is freedom. God's promise is, I've come to open the prison doors. I've come to set captives free. Some captives are going to be set free today. I believe it. There is a calling on you, and you can see it in that scripture there. There is a calling on you to live a certain way. To love your enemies. You may think, well, I haven't got any enemies. Well, you may not have any people enemies, but you've got enemy situations. There's all sorts of enemies. You've got to love your enemies. You've got to forgive You've got to bless those who curse you. You've got to turn the other cheek. That's the calling that is upon your life. It sounds unattainable. You've got to deal with hurtful stuff in such a way that you can just flip it aside and think nothing of it and return good for evil and smile and get over it and get on. Love, carry on your life. That is the calling that Jesus presents to you here. Now, either you're going to say, well, that's just not possible, in which case you throw, may as well throw the whole Bible away, or else you're going to say, God, you can enable me to do that in my situation. I'm going to believe the latter, okay? Four amens, it's going up. <laughs> this, this is, it is an extraordinary life. Uh, what Jesus is uh, presenting to us here. And it is um, exemplified by a Greek word, perison. And perison is the word where he says, if you only love those who love you, what are you doing more than, beyond, above, in excess of others? It's that more than. It's actually uh, the same word that is used where Jesus says I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly perison I can have more life than everybody else around me I can have life that goes beyond anybody else around me I can have life that exceeds what others have I can have capabilities to act and react in a way that goes beyond what others can do. I can have a life that makes people say, how do you do that? How do you react like that? How can you just forgive like that? How can you just, you know, make it like water off a duck's back as if that never happened to you? How do you do that? How do, how, I don't know what makes you tick. I would love if a few people came and asked me that question. No amens at all. Things are getting worse. Um, I would love it because that's evangelism in action. That's, you know, Peter says, always be ready to, to give an answer to those who ask you concerning the hope that is within you. And if they see you living an extraordinary life, a life that goes beyond what others are living, I know why you're silent because you think, well, I just can't do that. But I am here to bring the word of God to you that says, yes, you can. In the strength of Jesus, he is able to make you into that overcoming person. That thing that you've been circling around, do, do not need to circle around it any longer. You can get free. Jesus can set you free from that today. And you can start living a promised land life and get out of the wilderness life. So because you've got that calling on your life, and it is a calling on every Christian's life. There's no difference whether you're a brand new Christian. They were, they were straight out of Egypt. And he said, 11 days journey into the promised land. Straight into the promises. Straight into overcoming life. Straight into that. Because you have that calling to live that way. To bless those who curse you. To love your enemies. To pray for those who take advantage of you. Because you've got that calling, certain things are going to happen to you which will give you the opportunity to live like that and to react like that. Opportunity. Remember, we're talking about doors of opportunity. Now you know what kind of opportunities I'm talking about. People are going to curse you. Opportunity. People are going to use you and take advantage of you. 
opportunity people are going to hurt you opportunity people are going to say bad stuff about you people are going to try your patience they're going to stress you out life is going to stress you out and things are going to make you want to react a certain way you call it problems I call it opportunity now you've gone really quiet on me that is a door of opportunity and so often what we do is that instead of this becoming an opportunity to shine your light and to demonstrate the love of Christ and a victorious more than conqueror living we allow the hurt to get in am I the only one we allow the wound to enter we feel hurt we get annoyed we get slighted by what somebody said or did or how they treated us and we take what I call the fairness route the fairness route is when you say that was not fair that was not right why should she say that to me why did he do something that was so hurtful just at the, the time when I was down and low that had to come along that was so not right that was unfair anybody ever join me in saying that isn't it a typical reaction that we take we come along and we defend ourselves but when these things happen they are an opportunity for one of two kingdoms whenever these things happen that it's an opportunity for one of two kingdoms to rise up and to function in your life either the kingdom of this world which is headed up by the, the enemy of your soul and I want to say something at this point we have to realize that the enemy of our soul is the friend of our flesh the enemy of your soul is the friend of your flesh what do I mean by you know what I mean by the flesh I don't mean this stuff I mean I me mine self that side of me that the one that's always protecting myself that's what I mean by flesh he is the enemy of your soul but your flesh actually likes him my flesh sympathizes with, with a lot of what the devil tells me we are all people drawn two ways aren't we stood between two kingdoms there's a side of me that's hungry for God there's a side of me that wants more of God there's a side of me that's looking for blessing there's a side of me that, that just loves being in God and everything that God has for me and there's a side that's being pulled all of the time to I, me, mine don't you want that? yes I do don't you think somebody said that and they shouldn't have said it to you? yes I do, I agree and I'm agreeing all of the time with another side of me that wants me to rise up self to rise up that's what I mean by, by the enemy of your soul is the friend of your flesh. You sympathize with the devil more often than you would care to admit in church. You sympathize with the devil a lot. I know you do because I do. Amen, pastor. Good word. <laughs> he appeals to your flesh and he will tell you all sorts of stuff. Like you're not just going to stand around and let people talk like that to you are you retaliate react give them as good as they, they gave you yes you deserve to, to, to be hurt yes you should be hurt yes what they did with you, to you was so wrong and why should you put up with that ever heard that voice in your head that's how the devil talks it's the fairness route you your problem your hurt your issue your rights your entitlement have you noticed it's all about you the enemy of your soul is the friend of your flesh the friend of yourself and we have to recognize that we've got we've all got that propensity in us to follow that way to rise up to justify ourselves to take vengeance to, to, to all of that stuff is within us so like I said the, the, everything that happens in life is an opportunity for one of two kingdoms either the kingdom of this world run by Satan or the kingdom of God and the way of Jesus which is such a completely different reaction 
And every time that, that we allow the hurt to get a victory in us, every time that we come to our own defense, and every time we say, well, I'm, I'm leaving that church, I'm not going to allow people to speak like that to me. Every time you do that, you're allowing the devil a victory. You're developing an issue instead of developing freedom instead of getting free and getting beyond issues and into God's purposes and you can circle around one issue only takes one and you can circle around that for a lifetime I know people who, who've been in those situations that they, they've fallen out with the church or something's happened or somebody said something to them here and, and so that they've, they've gone off and they said well I'm not having that 20 years later they're still talking about it still can't get away from it it's still an issue it's still it's become a mountain that they're circling around and they're stuck in this issue. they haven't got free by leading leaving that church they've actually become imprisoned they've actually made a prison for themselves and they can't get out of it and you know I, I do believe that this is where we so often go wrong and it may be that some of you are offended a bit at, at what I just said because we, we might think how can it be wrong for me to speak up for what is right? How, how, how can it be wrong to, to speak out against what was unjust and unfair? How can it be wrong for me to defend myself against injustice? I can feel it rising up within me. How can, it, how can that be giving the devil a victory? Well, it may seem that you are doing the right thing. And it may be that what people said to you was, was wrong. That isn't the issue. I'm not saying that, that hurtful things were not said to you, that, that bad things did not happen to you. That's not the issue. That's not what matters here. What matters here is your choice of reaction. I'm just going to go back a slide so you see that. Your choice of reaction. You chose to defend yourself. You chose to defend your rights. You chose to take the route of vengeance but actually it was an opportunity for one of two kingdoms so okay you got hurt by the church so you say well I'm leaving that church so effectively what you're saying is okay you did this to me so see what I'm going to do to you now goodbye and don't expect me to say anything nice about you to anyone that is not a victory <laughs> That is not a victory. It's not justice. It's just vengeance. It's only a victory for the devil and his kingdom, which is all about division and unforgiveness and resentment and allowing hurts and wounds to dictate your actions and your reactions for the rest of your life. And those hurts and the, those wounds do not go away until Jesus comes in and heals them. They don't go away. They stay inside and they fester and they can influence your whole life and your outlook and your thinking. And they're reinforced all of the time that that, but that a voice coming into your mind saying, you were wronged, you were in the right to do what you did. That's not a victory. It's a prison sentence. And you'll find yourself walking around that mountain for 40 years and that grudge that you're holding on to will never go away. It will keep coming up and it will eat away at you. Each time, but there's victory in Jesus. Just in case you think I'm sounding too negative, there's victory in Jesus. That's what I'm coming to. That's where I'm going. I'm going somewhere. Each time you do that, you effectively lock a door against God working in your life remember I'm talking about doors of opportunity you can walk through doors you can take opportunities or you can actually lock doors against God being able to work in your life and bless you there are certain doors that we lock because of disappointment because there was something that we were praying for and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we believed God and it never happened yeah happened to anyone and what attitude are we going to take? What reaction are we going to have to that? Are we going to say, God, I prayed, I prayed. I don't know why the answer hasn't come. I'm still trusting you, God. I'm still believing you. You have your reasons. I don't get it. I don't understand it. But you are still God and I'm still going to trust in you. I'm still going to. Or are you going to allow that dis disappointment to make you offended against God? 
Well, what kind of God are you? You said you'd, you'd answer my prayers. You said all I needed to do was ask and, and it would be given. You, and I've been asking and asking and asking. It's never come. I don't get it. Where's the protecting God? Where's the, where's the hand of God? Where's the powerful hand of God? And you become offended against God. But you need to realize, you know, honestly, if Paul and Silas had taken that attitude when they were in the Philippian jail and they'd been beaten to within an inch of their lives and they're covered with blood and bruises and they're sat in this cold prison in the dead of midnight and if they'd been saying, well, what some kind of God you are, where's all of the protection that you promised me? Where's all of this thing that won't allow your, your, your angels will, will stop you unless you dash your foot against the stone? Where, where is the protecting hand of God? Where is, I'll not be afraid of the arrow that flies by day or that because none of these things, where's all that? Where are you, God? You've let me down. You've completely, this is, why are we in this situation? Where is the, the, the liberty that is promised by our God? I don't get it. And they'd sit there and they'd grumble. And they'd wonder what's happened to their faith. But no, at midnight, Paul and Silas sang praises to God. Why? Because they knew. They knew that God was in it. They had a reaction that says, I don't know why this happened, except that it, it, it says in the word that all who, who live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So I could have expected anyway. Jesus said, blessed are you, are you when people persecute you and call you all sorts of things and insult you and cast you into prison for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Great. Okay, they got hold of that word and they sang praises to God at midnight and if they hadn't sang praises if they'd been grumbling and complaining and doubting do you think there would have been an earthquake do you think that the whole that Philippian jailer and his family would have got saved do you think that everybody would have got set free on that night you can bet your bottom dollar they wouldn't have because faith brings victory and the right reaction brings the presence of God into that situation so, so there are doors that that get locked because of disappointment there are doors of hurt doors of rejection that we lock against God doors of resentment and because of resentment we're, we're locking a door against God doors of unforgiveness because we can't get over somebody did and we lock a door against God doors of marriage conflict let me speak to the wives for a minute you know you were right I'm getting some amens now. <laughs> Only from the ladies, but you know you were right and what he did was wrong. See? <laughs> and you won't let it go and you resent him and it's moving you further apart. Well, maybe you were right. Maybe he was wrong. But is your reaction the right one? And is that the way to make things right? Because if you want God back in your life and God back in your marriage, you've got to take the royal road. You've got to take the perison road. You've got to take the more than, beyond road. To love your enemies. Because you can have your enemies within a marriage. Of course you can. They always say that the people who hurt you the most are the ones closest to you. That's where so many wounds and, and damages can be done in those situations you need to take the word of God into that situation and find your victory in, in your reactions there you've got to forgive you've got to reconcile you've got to love when you don't feel like it the fairness route will get you nowhere it's a road to nowhere you have to take the royal road not the road of fairness the Jesus road the Perison road the road of beyond the road of abundant life and you can't do that on your own you've got to call on Jesus to help you to do that you can't do it on your own don't try it it won't work you'll run out of steam in two seconds you're going to need to call on the name of Jesus and those who call on the name of the Lord will find salvation they will find deliverance they will find help in time of trouble they will find enabling grace. You know my definition of grace? G-R-A-C-E. God's resources available, creating empowerment, empowering you, enabling you to live a life that you couldn't live before, enabling you to have reactions that you thought you could never have, enabling you to do what you thought was unattainable. That's the grace of God in your life. That's what he's able to do for you. 
but you've got to open the door of forgiveness if you're going to get back on track with God no use claiming your rights and how unfair it was and how you were badly treated and then expecting God to show up for you because actually you're going in the opposite direction from where God is going to show up and where the blessing of God lies. The royal road, the Perison road says there's another option. You can bless those who curse you. You can pray for those who persecute you, those who have a go at you. Let's put it in modern language. You can love those who have not shown love to you. Now these are very practical things. See, to bless somebody, you've got to open your mouth and say, I bless that so-and-so who I would rather hit with a brick. <laughs> I bless them in your name, despite what they did to me. And despite, can, you, can you feel the fight going on? I bless. I bless God. Show them favor today. God, let your face shine on them today. God, may they experience something exceptional today. All you've got to do is say it. Let the words come out of your mouth. You may be gritting your teeth, but let the words come out of your mouth. Do good to those who hate you. That person who hates you, no doubt they do. They hate you. Get a £20 note, put it in a brown envelope, and get it delivered secretly to their door. Just pop it through the letterbox. They won't know who it's come from. Do good. It's practical. This is the royal road. This is the royal road. This is the way of blessing. You're going to find so much freedom. You're going to enter into something that your night is going to become like noonday. You're going to arise into a way of living. Pray for those who persecute you. Pray for them. Think, okay, how can I pray for them? Not hit them with a brick, Lord, but something else. Pray for those who have a go at you. Love your enemies probably that's the hardest one of all because that goes right to the heart can you love them God no I can't I can't I can't I'm struggling but God you can give me the grace to be able to wait do you think well, when you ask God for that he's going to give you that of course he is of course he is ask and it shall be given people may not have been right to curse you or to have a go at you but does Jesus ever once tell you to come to your own defense the answer is no, if you're in any doubt. He never tells you to justify why they were wrong to curse you, and you were right to call them out. Never. Because that Perison way, the way of Jesus, is not about being right. It's about your reaction when people do things or say things to you that you think are wrong. And there is a way out. There is a way of victory. There is a way to break prison doors. There is a way to break chains. There is a way that will restore your fellowship with God. And you will know again the sweetness of his love and his favor. You'll know the security of his love. And that will overcome any hurt and disappointment. I've known God come into my life and just sweep away disappointments sweep away hurt sweep away wounds that can be your experience when you ask God to come in and to do those things and you when you do that actually you're unlocking doors you're unlocking doors that have been shut because of hurt and disappointment and rejection and and some of the ways in which that happens is just through praise sometimes when when we're saying God you're my my, my living hope and chains are broken and strongholds are going to come down when you declare those things when you praise when you decide to have an attitude of thankfulness despite the fact that you're absolutely in the pit when you don't feel like anything when everything and everybody is having a go at you when you're just worn down you decide to praise that is an open door folks that is a key that unlocks the, 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 you into going into the presence of God I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart as soon as I get thanksgiving in my heart I've got a key in my hand and I unlock that door and I walk into the courts of God I walk into the place of praise I walk into his presence in his presence there's fullness of joy when I'm, jo when I'm full of joy the joy of the Lord is my strength I'm able to overcome I'm, I'm, I'm walking can you see what that road is like you take that road and you start to get free. Set yourself free. Praise, thanksgiving, grace. Once these things are released back into your life, you'll find the victory is easy. 
And these are your helps, they're like the wind in your sails that, that helps the, the victory to happen, to, you, to enable you to love despite, to, to enable you to have grace despite what people said, to enable you to reconcile despite, to enable you to move on despite everything that's happened. 2020 is going to be full of opportunities. And now you know what I mean by opportunities. It's going to be full of people cursing you. It's going to be full of people giving you a hard time. It's going to be full of problem situations. It's going to be full of stress. It's going to be full of all sorts of things. They are opportunities for you to take one route or the other. Somebody said this about opportunities. The opportunity of a lifetime must be seized within the lifetime of the opportunity. Because opportunities have a shelf life. We talk about a window of opportunity. It's there and then it's gone. The door is presented to you. You've got the choice. Which way am I going to react? You don't have long to decide. But you make the choice. It's an opportunity for you to enter the road of blessing. Take advantage of the moment. And it could be for you the opportunity of a lifetime. The opportunity to get out of unforgiveness that you've been stuck with for, for 40 years. It could be the opportunity for you to get out of resentment and that thing that you've held towards a person for so long. It could be today is an opportunity. There's an opportunity to be seized today. And there's a lifetime of this opportunity. It's going to end about 12.30 when this meeting stops. And then you'll get thinking about other things. But there's a window of opportunity for you. Worship team, please come and join me. If you walk through that door of opportunity, God's way, the kingdom way, the royal way, then that door for you will become an open door that no man can shut. It will become a God door and a door of victory, a door of blessing, a door of freedom. It becomes a way of life to you. And when you're in that way of life, you'll find that you reach the place where nothing that anybody does to you can hurt you. Nothing can knock you over. Nothing can stop you. Or if it does knock you over, you just get back up again. Because you're living in love, you're living in forgiveness, you're living in freedom, you're living in praise. Reconciliation is easy. Forgiveness is easy. You can brush it off. Whatever happened, yeah, they said that. I know they said that to me. But you know, people have problems. They have issues of their own. Probably they're going through something. But I can forgive. I can love. I can bless. I can pray. I can get over it. I can get on. Would you like to have that attitude? Whatever happens, it's yours. Believe it and it's yours. Take hold of it from Jesus and it's yours. Call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved from that issue. Call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be delivered from that slavery and that prison sentence. Call upon the name of the Lord and chains will break. Call upon the name of the Lord and prison doors will open just as surely as it did for Paul and Silas in that Philippian jail. Can't do it on your own, but with Jesus you can. Christian life was never meant to be done on our own. Always with Jesus. Unforgiveness creates a heart of stone, a hardening, a coldness. And we lose the softness that God wants us to have towards others. But forgiveness and going God's way, it's like it reminds me of a scripture in Isaiah 58, and I'm closing with this, where Isaiah says, if you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger, the finger says, they, they did that to me. Everything would have been okay if it wasn't for them. If that situation hadn't occurred, you don't know what they said to me. You don't know what they, if you put away the pointing finger, and malicious talk and if you spend yourself on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed get on with kingdom work get yourself involved in the work of God minister to others stretch out your hand towards others instead of being obsessed with your own stuff all of the time if you'll do that here's the promise you ready 
then your light will rise in the darkness. And your night will become like the noonday. Your life will be flooded with light. And every trace of darkness will disappear. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. All around you may be a desert. All around you may be dry and dead, full of accusations and vehement, angry people and everybody having a go. But God will satisfy you. You will find yourself in an oasis in the middle of that desert. He will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. No matter what's coming in from the desert, no matter what's coming in from that place of dryness and deadness, no matter what people say, no matter what's happened in the past, there's a spring of water bubbling up within you, enabling you to forgive, enabling you to have grace, enabling you to love, enabling you to bless, enabling you to get over the past, enabling you, and it's setting you free. Prison doors are opening. What doors have you locked against God? Disappointment? Unforgiveness? Resentment? Rejection? Hurt? Wounds? We've all got them, that's for sure. Have you been listening to the voice that says, that wasn't fair, that wasn't right, what they did to you? That's not God's voice. It was a voice designed to trap you in a wilderness so that you're always feeling hard done by, always feeling mistreated, always feeling that you were in the right, but stuck and getting nowhere. You see, if you're not living that victorious perish on beyond life, then in some measure you're missing out on what God intended for you. Abundance, more than excess. Life to the full, it's expressed in so many ways. I just need to know, is this speaking to anyone? The situations that you want to get free of, the situations where you find yourself stuck, if it is, I just want you to respond by just raising your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Anything that, because Jesus is here to set you free today. Today is a day of freedom. Today is a day of liberty. Today is a day of breaking chains. Today is a day when prison doors can come open. You can live in the abundance. You can live in the promise and not in the wilderness. Don't circle around that mountain for a lifetime. There's a road to freedom. You can arise out of whatever you've been locked in. Thank you, Father. I just want you to, as you're turning things, these things over in your mind and in your heart, allowing the Holy Spirit just to identify maybe things that you've even forgot about and yet they're still down there at the bottom hurting down there at the bottom holding you back chaining you down just ask God to identify those things to you so that you can choose to walk free you can choose liberty you can choose life Whatever you've been locked into, you can sing. And we're going to sing now, living hope. And that can become such a real reality to you. You are my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Praise the one who set me free today. Praise the one who's opened prison doors for me today. Death has lost its grip on me. The death 
of the wilderness, the death of the desert and the dryness is going to lose its grip on some people today. Strongholds are going to come down. And that, that, that word that says, you have broken every chain. There is salvation in your name. There is deliverance in your name. There is freedom in your name. That is going to be your portion today as you step into that. And as we sing right now, let's do it with that attitude and let's get free in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you like to stand?